Welcome to the second interview for Extra Texture at uh, Kucha Fritos Gallery in conjunction with Artists Alliance. Uh, I'm Joshua Johnson. Uh, this is a project that examines the city in the age of globalization, uh, the Anthropocene, and a, a accelerating technology. Uh, Ross Exo Adams, who is here with us today, is an architect, urbanist, and writer the historical and political intersection of circulation and urbanization. His work has been published and presented widely on inherent relations between architectural practice and geography, political and legal theory, ecology and philosophy. Ross holds a PhD from the London Consortium 2014, for which he was awarded the 2011 Oza, sorry Ross, I'm not gonna say that right, Oz Ozillans studentship by uh, the- I think it's Kozolins, but I'm not really, I've never heard it actually spoken, so. Thank you. Your guess is as good as mine. Yeah, <laughs> by the Royal Institute of British Architects, and he has taught at Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL, the Architectural Association, the Burlage Institute, and is currently assistant professor of architecture at Iowa State University. So thank you, Ross, for being here with, uh, with me today. Um, thank you. This is Nice invitation. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to cover a range of issues, um, but I wanted to start uh, just by having, see if you could provide a brief introduction to your background and your interest in urbanism and architecture. Sure, yeah. Um, so I both practiced as an architect and, and studied architecture uh, starting in about 2000, uh, about 15 years ago, 16 years ago, wherever we are. Um, and it was my ambition initially to, to practice. And uh, so I worked in lots of different firms uh, around, kind of all around the world, uh, starting in New York City in small uh, residential firms. And uh, moving, I moved to Holland to work in uh, MVRDV, which is a kind of more uh, design oriented kind of uh, at the time very cutting edge sort of uh, conceptual design work um, and I eventually uh, worked in in London um, in a firm called well, in Foster and Partners which is quite a big architecture firm um, in uh, also Arab uh, which is a massive engineering firm uh, and in between I worked also in Mexico City for a, a young firm called Productora um, so I think, uh, I, I, well, in, in 2009, I kind of left, I made a decision to leave practice and to begin working um, within a more academic setting. And so, of course, to do that, I wanted to first uh, write a PhD. Um, and, and the PhD, I think, was driven in, in a large part to my, uh, dr driven by my, my experiences, uh, especially in the end of my, uh, my practices in places like uh, Foster and Partners and Arup uh, working in urban design. Um, was, there so, was there something in particular about your experience here that made you feel like you really needed to, to develop more of a theoretical background? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think I, I've always had a sort of interest in um, kind of pulling apart things uh, from how they sort of appear and sort of seeing what makes things tick and how things, uh, you know, what are the forces. Um, but I, I also did a master degree somewhere in between then, uh, in between this kind of period, in the Berlach Institute with a guy called Pierre Vittorio Arelli, who was at the time a very kind of a young voice in architecture, uh, who was giving a very kind of clear um, a reading of politics in regards to architecture and understanding architectural form as immediately political in a certain sense. Um, and so I think I was definitely uh, I'm sorry, could you, inspired it, by a lot of this stuff it, it, together. It, it, it out a little bit there. You're saying he gave a very ah, clear, okay. yeah. He, he gave a very clear um, sort of relationship to all of us, I think, studying with him uh, between the political, if you want, and architecture, and our, especially architectural form. To, as a way to kind of read beyond the sort of semiotics of, uh, of power, maybe, that were kind of common in the 70s, 80s, and to an extent in the 90s, 
Um, and, and looking more at understanding uh, forces of neoliberalization, um, or, you know, contemporary developer-driven urbanization, capitalism, and trying to kind of restitute uh, a project for architecture within this space where architectural form in a way could somehow um, uh, respond and, and um, exert a sort of counter project, if you want. And I, I think it was an incredibly influential moment. I was working with, with Pierre Vittorio, but also uh, other people like Ilias and Gellis. And uh, it was a very new discussion at the time. And I think the group of us that were uh, studying with him, we had a lot of kind of collective energy behind the project. And it was really, um, it, it helped me kind of shape uh, a lot of the thoughts and, and ideas that I'd had kind of rattling around the back of my head and, and to try to also see architecture as a discourse much more critically. So after working with him, I went immediately, I'd been working in these really designy boutique kind of offices, which was fun, but I also saw it as a bit of a fantasy in a way and um, avoiding kind of uh, sort of bigger problems at play. And so I wanted to work in the sort of the belly of the beast, uh, the kind of large corporate signature firms that were building cities at that point already. And this, like building cities was kind of a new thing in the early 2000s. Um, so I went immediately to Foster and Partners. Uh, tremendously, you know, if, if we're talking about neoliberalism and architecture, I think uh, um, Foster is one of the first firms that might come to mind. Uh, it's developing all like in, with a sort of a sycophancy around the, the client sort of uh, uh, character in the whole building process. Um, so I went there to see how things work and to kind of be an insider and to try to figure out, you know, how these forces are at play. And uh, shortly after um, being there, I was offered a position in Arab Urban Design, which... Uh, uh, of course, as an urban design firm, was taking seriously that notion of designing cities. And especially yeah. at that moment, the eco city was the big thing, and they were kind of pushing the agenda with that. Uh, and so, partly skeptical, but partly also hopeful, let's say, I was thinking a more interesting place to be. And I think it really was um, the whole discussion about sustainability, ecological urbanism, and of course, now resilience. Um, you know, I, I got to see firsthand how that works and also to see how kind of dirty and, uh, let's say, thin, how, how dirty the politics and economies were behind those projects and how thin a lot of those projects really were. Uh, the idea of greenwashing was more or less the kind of business we were in, but much more than, much worse than that, um, you know, we were, we were in population displacement. Uh, in, in certain projects. Uh, I was working on a project in China that was to develop an eco city that had all these wonderful you know, circular economies of uh, farming and everything within them. Uh, but it would, you know, inconveniently to the people who live there, the 55,000 people who live there, we were proposing and developing strategies for their displacement effectively. Um, uh, kind of radical deterritorialization and reterritorial. Like either they could become urban citizens, which in China is a legal status between rural and urban um, citizen, or they could kind of um, find we could you know make uh, new proposals that we wouldn't, of course, have any control over about where they would live elsewhere. So, it's, and these kinds of things uh, were sort of adopted into the practice without any criticism um, because we were yeah. so. Um, Con uh, confident in the fact that we were building a better world, making cities that weren't there before in the first place, but nevertheless making them with a, a smaller ecological footprint than business as usual. And, and even that idea of like, um, it, you know, uh, if someone else is going to do it, they're going to do it worse, so we better do it. This was a very kind of common idea in the office. Uh, so I quickly became uh, critical of the, of, of the practices there and, and the way that this, that the in a way, the whole knowledge of contemporary urban design was being constructed through practice, a kind of considered reflection on what it means to do urban design, but really driven through the new markets that were opening up around the world for urban design itself, making cities. Um, so very interesting kind of period, and, and immediately after leaving, I published my first piece uh, in Radical Philosophy on, uh, on that and jumped into my PhD right away. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I can talk about my research if you want as well, but...
um, it, it was definitely influential on uh, shaping the way that I kind of then embraced research. Yeah, it seems like you really sort of, you know, uh, took, a, took a step into the practical space and, you know, after maybe kind of coming from a bit of an academic direction initially and then uh, decided that or found that maybe the way that that was being uh, understood within those spaces had its own sort of limits. So then very much took a step back to kind of see if it was possible to maybe redraw the sort of boundaries of that practice. Would that be a, a sort of... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think now. that's right. Yeah, um, I, I guess my initial impulse was uh, driven by the fact that you know, I was very interested in, in the history of urban design and the way that you know, the discourse uh, within architecture at least, and, and also in geography, had uh, painted the picture of like, you know, the 19th century being this kind of new way of understanding the city um, and, and, and all these new kinds of, uh, you know, projects that started appearing, of course, Houseman and, and so on, uh, give character to this history. But what's interesting is that within the discourse of architecture at least, uh, it's driven and it's really formed much more by kind of an art historical framework. So we look at periods, periodizations, um, styles, you know, various technologies uh, that then inform the styles, influences various, you know, architecture, architects or, or uh, in some cases engineers that, uh, that a lot of people would start to emulate, uh, all in an effort to kind of... Uh, 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 argue for a kind of cohesion in, of one period versus another and how, you know, when you move from 1749 to 1750, apparently everything changes and, and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, at the same time, in, in geography discourses, uh, obviously, you know, the, the birth of, or, or the generalization of capitalism as a dominant mode of production uh, helps to give shape to the same, the very same phenomena. The fact that suddenly all over Europe, cities were being restructured uh, new laws, new governments, new, um, new municipal uh, structures, and so on would just jump up and, and transform everything. Uh, and that would be explained away as, well, capitalism, right? It changes everything, and, and so the 19th century, the birth of modernity, and whatever else. And I always had, had felt that between these two, um, we were missing something, and uh, uh, we were missing a way... Uh, not only of analyzing this tr radical transformation that then you can just see kind of rippling around the world, um, you know, in parallel, but also um, kind of linearly from that point onwards, uh, but but also that we uh, sort of lack uh, kind of uh, theoretical and historical grounding around which to understand the, the results of those spaces that actually were produced. Um, so and, and so you're you're sort of. Uh, interest in developing the concept of urbanism. Yeah. So, so and this, it took me a while to figure that out. <laughs> I guess yeah. it's probably yeah. normal writing a PhD, but uh, in fact, I think it was even discovered, I mean, I, I had written almost the entire thesis at this point, and I was developing lots of what I thought were really kind of interesting ideas, and then Suddenly, I, I came across Neil Brenner and his work on planetary organization. And the way he sort of was asking these questions was like, exactly, that's what I'm looking for. Is, this, is, this is what I'm trying to, to ask. And it helped me really codify a lot of my thinking, for which I'm, I'm very grateful you know, for, for his work. And uh, he's a colleague and friend of mine. Um, but I guess the other thing that I started to realize was that within contemporary urban uh, discourse, so including Brenner and, and Schmidt and, and all the others who are looking at urban theory, social sciences and geography, we tend to carry on a tradition uh, that comes from the 20th century, which is to look at the city in the immediate present, look at urbanization processes in the immediate present, and to sort of uh, so you constantly look outside and, and see where things are changing, you know, tremendously. And in fact, just, you know, we almost understand urbanization itself as the site of change, of rapid change. And, and by doing that, we, of course, find certain things but leave other things behind, um, like what is the nature and, of the space that we create. But also, 
this sort of obsession with the present is something I, of course, I've written about, as you, you probably know, um, where we, by, by kind of focusing on how the urban is changing in the immediate present and how it's kind of always destabilizing itself, whatever, um, we tend to kind of assume that it's a natural process, that it's something that's always existed and therefore it doesn't need its own uh, historicism, historic, uh, historicization or its own kind of theorization. Uh, it's just about kind of tracking it in its immediate changes and crazy whatever is happening. Um, so I, I was very fascinated with that because, again, when you're looking at the various histories, if you sort of step back, you see like, wow, there's this radical transformation of the city, right? Of, of like the city just suddenly looks very different and is operating in very different ways and is expanding as it never has. And you know, is that really historically consistent? Is it, can we go back in the 15th century, the 12th century, the 10th century, whatever, and see a city changing as urbanization? Or are we actually dealing with something that is radically new at a certain point? Um, and so Wait. that's something that I think yeah, I mean, you, you suggest in, in your in your writings and, and, and stuff that, that there's a kind of distinction to be had between the urban and the city, and, and I guess I was hoping you could maybe, I mean, maybe you're getting to that. Sure. Yeah, but you could maybe explain yeah. that sort of, and how that relates to these these other issues that you're, you're introducing right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, and on one hand, it's a bit of a polemic for me. It's, it's a way to... Um, pose a question that I think hasn't really been posed yet, at least in the way I'm trying to do it. Um, so, I mean, in, in, you know, I don't like uh, exclusively use the term urban today because I believe that we don't live in a city anymore, although that is part of what I'm sort of arguing. Uh, it's obviously still a good shorthand and that stuff. But um, I'm, I'm kind of borrowing from a, a bit from this guy, Ildefonso Cerda, about whom a lot of my thesis and a lot of my... Um, my research is, is on. So, uh, so Ilovanza Cerda is uh, a Spanish uh, civil engineer, basically, from, uh, who was born in 1815, died in 1876. Um, and, and he's a sort of um, aristocrat, a military guy. Um, but he's, he's obsessed with, um, with the kind of modernization of the city, uh, in, in sort of, in short. Uh, and so, we know of him in the history of architecture pretty well. He's a, he's a well-known character, but we know of him because of his plan for Barcelona, for, for the reform and extension of Barcelona, uh, the Chamfer grid and so on. Uh, but what we don't tend to pay attention to are, are the kind of prolific, if not kind of crazy or, or um, fanatical writings that he did. Um, in fact, he bankrupted himself just writing and writing and writing about his kind of theories. He coined the term urbanization in 1861. So this is kind of an interesting kind of fact in itself that we didn't really have a term. Um, but much more than that, um, because he's, he believes himself to be the inventor of, of urbanization, he also provides us, I think, a really interesting, uh, as, as a kind of a guide uh, into the world of the 19th century as a sort of... Uh, as I like to think of it as a sort of accidental biographer of a process that's already happening, of a space that's already taking shape in his time. And because of his um, belief that he's really inventing this, he kind of, he allows, he, he, he condenses very clearly uh, these ideas of urbanization or, or the processes and the actual facts of urbanization, of which he statistically catalogs like, like a, a crazy man. Um, he, he crystallizes them in these very concrete diagrams in a way, uh, both literally like in drawings, but also in the way he's thinking and, and writing about the space. And I think uh, if in retrospect, if we have someone like Foucault uh, in, our, in our backpack, let's say, uh, it's easy to then look back at, at the way he's thinking about the urbe, as he calls it. He rejects the idea of the city. He says the yeah. city is no longer, we're in a new space. Um, we can, we can see uh, through his writings a really um, uh, a strong relationship forming between the way that the space of the, of the urbe, as he talks about it, uh, is, is being organized, and a, a new kind of political uh, order that, that not only you know, allows it to be, but in a way is kind of indistinguishable from the organization of space. 
Yeah, you you mentioned that for for oh, him. Is something for certain? Sorry. I'm sorry. What? No. Yeah. Continue, please. Oh, I was going to say no. You you mentioned that for him it really seemed like the that architecture uh, and and a sort of democratic uh, control of the structure of the city would would come to supplant politics, or or rather yeah. for him it was almost a politics by by another means. Yes. Yeah. And I guess I'm, I'm wondering maybe how, how you trace sort of that, that kind of genealogy to the contemporary sort of uh, yeah. technical city planners, you know, where we now have smart cities like yeah. Sondo, uh, but yeah. even interventions in terms of New York and it's, it's sort of like management of its, the future of its city. Uh, yep. These things kind of can be maybe traced back to this genealogy and stuff. Yeah, 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 as well. Sure. sure. Yeah. So, so uh, for Serda, it's uh, you know one of the things that if you read his work, uh, the thing you'll you'll start to see is that he his he's a super harsh uh, critic of the sort of inherited cities of, of uh, you know the Baroque and medieval you know Europe. And uh, he's, he's critical of them, uh, not, bec not only because they're inconvenient to modern capitalist uh, demands and movement and, and industry and so on, but he's critical because he sees really no distinction between uh, the city walls, the inconvenience and blockages of streets, and um, the sort of the ways in which market squares are organized or, or not organized. He sees that as manifestations of a very oppressive politics, the one, of course, that was overthrown um, by this sort of end of the 19th, end of the 18th century. And so, I mean, very much following a kind of St. Simonian uh, ideology, and he's a, a card-carrying St. Simonian himself, uh, he sees that uh, we can do away with, with the state. We can do away with politics altogether. We can enter into this technocratic uh, utopian space of exchange um, that, uh, you know, only needs the sort of benign management of administrators and, and kind of a technocrats, basically. Yeah. And so the urbe, for him, again, this kind of reduced space of movement and dwelling, the center of this kind of grid that extends across the entire world to, to make one, you know, join city or urbe, um, is the way for him to kind of not only address the needs that he sees of a kind of an emerging, you know, dominant capitalism and liberal society and freedom of movement, but also as a, as a way to kind of politically overthrow the state. And it's in that move, I think, that he doesn't necessarily realize that, that the urbe, even if, if we take him at his word, if we, if we construct the urbe as a giant... I'm sorry, uh, Ross. Uh, sort of and, and, and. Mm -hmm. oh, say again. Sorry, Ross. Could you repeat that last sentence? You sort of broke up there slightly. Oh yeah. Um, uh, let's see if I can remember. <laughs> um, he sees he sees this this idea, this vision of the urbe, this idea of a kind of one interconnected global city, effectively. Uh, not only as a way to address the needs of capitalism and liberal society and the nation state and exchange and the individual and, you know, everything that we can imagine around this time, uh, but also as a way to kind of politically do away with politics. It's, it's, this is this very kind of liberal, uh, 19th century liberal ideology that uh, is itself a politics to do away with politics. And again, I, I, I draw from a kind of Schmidt, Schmidtian reading of that. Uh, but Serdar really exemplifies that in a way that, that I think for sure continues up into the present today in a way that we constantly um, ass assuage ourselves that uh, all the problems that manifest themselves with regards to ecology um, uh, and, and far beyond that, uh, efficiency of movements of city, equality, equal access to technology, everything, everything, every kind of problem that presents itself has its solution in technology. And uh, again, I think again, working in a place like Arab showed me like, firsthand how that ideology is kind of manufactured and how something like an architectural rendering is part of this, um, this, this kind of politics that helps us to gloss over you know, the, the nature of, of the spaces that we create, the infrastructures, the, the, the certain connectivities and relationships, the machinic kind of spaces, 
uh, and so on. Well, I'm really, uh, I'm really from the, the politics that were structured. I want to your thought if you had uh, if you had something else to add there. Um, nope, that's, no, it. that's it. I was just going to say I'm really glad you actually brought up um, the the sort of notion of rendering. Um, and the idea that, that architecture could simply be contained in this drawing or this diagram. Uh, I know in one of your, your other uh, papers, you sort of use Buckminster's Fully, full, uh, Buckminster Fuller's <laughs> Thymaxian world map as this kind of illustration of, of a kind of uh, uh, world broken down in, into a sort of metric architecture or sort of digitized space in which everything is sort of neatly delineated and yet it, it seems sort of empty and and kind yeah. of as it's reductive i guess is the word I yes use. yeah um, but yeah uh i guess i was wondering do you see what a role for these kind of uh, uh Types of work like drawing or representation, uh, moving forward uh, in terms of how we address the future. I mean, I think one of the major problems uh, in terms of kind of making this connection between politics and architecture, or between uh, the state of these sort of large systems such as the neoliberal system, uh, is that they're oftentimes mm -hmm. invisible, insidious. I think is so much of your your work works to reveal. Um, and, and certainly something like Jameson's uh, cognitive mapping uh, a problem comes to mind here. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, maybe in relation to this sort of yeah. problem of diagramatization and, and rendering the world in a particular way. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't want to go on too long, but yeah, I guess I'm just wondering what, what your thoughts are in regards to that. No, yeah. no, no, no. Lots, of, lots of really interesting points there. Um, I mean, one hand, I think uh, can, you can hear me okay, yeah? Yes. Okay. Um, Buckminster Fuller, I think, is a fascinating character. To me, he's, he's really a kind of uh, Serda of the 20th century. He's a guy who believes, you know, in this idea that, that very much like Serda, that, that politics can be um, replaced altogether and, and rendered uh, completely unnecessary through technology and technocratic administrations of life, you know, under his new kind of geodesic world. And, and um, the, the comment that I was making uh, in that essay uh, that you mentioned was the way that, that OMA has actually used the map, the kind of taking that as a sort of uh, framework through which to not only put data and, and mappings of their, of, you know, this sort of um, ecological future, this roadmap 2020 publication that they did a few years ago. Um, but it makes a statement, of course, because, you know, these representations are neutral. And the use of a kind of, 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 of something from Buckminster Fuller is also a statement about technology and a statement about politics. And it's quite clear in that representation that these two kind of Damaxian globes, um, one next to the other, uh, the one is, you know, parceling out the world into these, you know, these uh, new, these technos, you know, called like Wintopia and, you know, Geothermalopolis or who knows what, these kind of silly names, which is, of course, a polemic, but it's, it, it shows the imagination that we can, we can imagine the entire world to be an apolitical space, but then with the second map only needs, like, duh, to be connected, and then once we're connected, everything's fine, and and we've solved all problems, again, with technology and circulation. Um, so I think, I mean, I, I, that's, that's on one hand. Um, and I think, you know, today we, we still use mappings. And, and obviously, mappings are incredibly powerful tools because they reduce things. And that's, that's what's uh, so important. Uh, my students, I, I have them uh, constantly working on drawings that help us to um, to not explain something in a kind of pedagogical way, but to actually reveal uh, certain relations of power to space and vice versa. Um, and it's not easy to kind of do this stuff, but I think, you know, it's nevertheless a really interesting task. And it's just the same when you write an essay. You don't write about everything, you write about something specific, and so you reduce a problem to something that can be, you know, articulated. Um, but I think there is nevertheless a tendency that we have uh, today with, 
sort of global, uh, or you might call it planetary imaginaries, um, that that are very interesting again, and you know, the figure of the planetary is becoming something around which a lot of people are speaking, planetary urbanization, obviously, uh, but also it helps us to, to articulate ways of, of seeing climate change and so forth. Um, but it also has a, has a downside to it, or also has a kind of restrictive capacity that in a way um, uh, freezes us and, and, and renders us somehow inoper inoperative to be able to kind of, um, it, 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 it's somehow a language for, for depicting totalities. And I think that can be on, on one hand really helpful, but also very limiting. And so uh, recently I was asked to, res to respond to this kind of question on this Urban Next forum. Uh, it's an online uh, sort of uh, journal. Uh, about the sort of five predominant planetary models or world models, so like Ricky Burdett and the kind of urban age ideologies, uh, Richard Florida's spiky something or other. Um, I, I, I'm not totally familiar with all these, but you can kind of get them really quickly. Yeah, uh, obviously, planetary like urbanization. Florida's uh, rise in the creative class, and, and that yeah. how his, his sort of ideology has had a, had a certain influence on the gentrification of, of urban exactly. communities. And, exactly. And large number of, you know. Um, yeah, um, and, and obviously planetary urbanization is, is within this, this notion, and there was recently an exhibition in Yale uh, by Bimal Mendes and Joyce uh, Sang called uh, The City of Seven Billions, so it's trying to imagine the entire world as one city, and how does that sort of change? And, and all of these, I think, are really wonderful, even in a way the Ricky Burdett, Ricky, Ricky Burdett and Richard Florida sort of things in making things visible, which is, which is what mappings do. Um, but I think, you know, the more I, I look at someone like Serda, who already in the 19th century was identifying in this thing that he called the urbe, a fractal sort of space. It wasn't a space that's based on scales. Uh, it was something that would repeat itself at every different scale you look at it, which I thought was a tremendous kind of discovery, even though this guy's a bit nuts. And I think with regard to like these, these mappings and, and sort of planetary imaginaries, we again tend to have some presuppositions that, that underpin those readings. Namely that, uh, and, and again, this draws on the sort of 20th century history of urban studies, which is always about sort of jumping scales, you know, sort of, um, the Smith idea, but also the way that urban studies folks would go out and be like, oh, wow, I just felt bigger than this kind of metropolitan urbanization. I'm going to name it, you know, whatever. And then in the next year, someone would find something even larger. And in that sense, I think planetary urbanization, while it's, of course, much more sophisticated, it does fall into the trap of seeing things as just getting bigger. And, of course, the scale of the planet and then, of course, even the atmosphere and, the, and space itself being urbanized with satellites and everything. You know, we see it. We see the tendency. And it forces us then to, on one hand, again, treat the urban as a sort of totality that, you know, who's ever to intervene in that space? How are you ever to kind of form a, a, a critical practice that, that operates in that? How are you ever to, of course, form resistance to planetary urbanization if it's so totalizing? Um, but also, it, it forecloses us from being able to see how the urban, in a way, might not have any scale at all. This is one of the other sort of things that I've been thinking a lot about. And, uh, you know, I I even when you look at things like cybernetics and planetary computation and whatever else, you also have to address the microscopic in the way that, you know, the way that microchips are designed, the way that um, cybernetic urbanism completely transforms the practice of urban design as something of like transforming it purely through a kind of digital virtual um, restructuring. It's, it's about allowing cities to be dirty and romantic and everything that like the urban age people kind of uh, romanticize while at the same time radically restructuring it. So yeah, I think again it's about using maps but, but constantly questioning how we do it using, you know, uh, renderings uh, but then also constantly questioning how we do those. Well, um, I mean, it's like the problem with sort of reduction in terms of the math, as you say in the beginning, is that you start out attempting to reveal or address a, a very particular feature which you're emphasizing. And that's what the map sort of comes to represent to the exclusion of other things. 
and then once this gets blown outside of its own scale mm -hmm. or its sort of context of, of addressment and gets applied to everything else, it yeah. totally obliterates all these other nuances, context, and mm -hmm. structures that may be important at distinct levels or in yeah. different scopes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's just something we have to, it's not to abandon these practices at all, but to somehow use them uh, in coordination with other techniques. And um, yeah, it's something, it's a conversation that I've been having with Neil and, and also Nikos Katsikis, who I know as well within the Urban Theory Lab, about mapping, about history also. Um, uh, and, and a lot of the kind of presuppositions to make when you're doing research. Uh, but that nonetheless are important to address and to, to kind of criticize and to open up you know, other ways of looking in. So. Cool. Um, I wanted to, I, I briefly wanted to, uh, let me think, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my notes here, so it's, it's going to take mm -hmm. me a moment to, uh, to, to kind it's of okay. gears to click. Um, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Well, I mean, I guess one of the things that, that maybe we didn't quite, quite get to was, was the idea of circulation uh, in Serdaz's mm -hmm. writing, uh, because that's mm -hmm. very important. Although, although I think you sort of addressed it uh, uh, in, mm -hmm. in some respect in terms of it kind of, he, he was very much in terms of for this sort of like open system that allows this sort of fluid movement through the city and, and that mm -hmm. uh, uh, structure. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, I mean, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, because I yeah, think yeah, actually, I, I do. Um, so when I first kind of uh, uh, started reading his work and, and his obsession with circulation, you know, this idea that you would design space, you know, first and foremost around networks of, and abstract networks of movement, um, obviously my first, start, my first thoughts were about like, Foucault and his discussion about circulation and the milieu in the late 18th century and these kinds of things. Um, and I think there's, a, there's a, almost an easy reading to be made with respect to um, the way that, that, that the networks of circulation that Serda talks about carve out these sort of spaces left over, which he discovers are actually uh, really important, i.e. domestic you know, urban blocks where people live. And we start to see this really interesting play between circulation uh, in this quasi-theological sort of sense of like transcendental movement across the world. And then uh, the, the house as, again, preceding things like uh, Corbusier's ideas of the house as a machine for living, uh, Serdar was very, very uh, um, curious about this and very um, inquisitive about how to think about uh, domesticity as a kind of technology, and as a technology which directly addresses the population. So again, these very Foucauldian kind of terms come up. Um, and, you know, he was doing things like calculating the volume of air within a house, uh, and then calculating the volume of air that would be produced by the kind of gardens that would be uh, adjacent to and behind the blocks. And very almost like slaughter uh, sort of ontologies around uh, domesticity. Um, and, and you can really start to, I mean, you can kind of divide the entire discourse of, of the of urbanization, as he talked about it, between networks, the network of ways or circulation and domesticity or like the population. So all of it really gives itself almost a clear biopolitical analysis. There was a bit of a break up there at that last point. You were saying oh. networks of circulation, domesticity, and, and then you yeah and, and I was saying use itself to um, a, a very clear Foucauldian uh, reading of, of space and how space becomes this new apparatus of a kind of administer, administrative power that literally circulates through space and that and that intervenes much more uh, um, intimately into domestic spaces whereas in the space of the roadways and then the ways let's say isolate. It works to isolate all the individuals from one another. So it's, it's so much fascinating stuff you can read in that. Um, but but um, as, I, as I started to then see circulation as something that I, I didn't want to just take for granted as something that sort of appears in a biological kind of way in the 19th century and therefore makes sense to be read this way, 
Uh, but to try to then actually step back and trace it back, uh, uh, doing a kind of an a, a archaeology of, of spaces that are transformed through ideas of circulation, um, I, I suddenly found myself getting way into the history of territory, and so drawing a lot from Stuart Elliman and his work, Territory. Um, and, and, and in fact, going far before circulation is ever actually a, a notion understood uh, or, or mentioned as such. Um, and, and, and with that, I also started to get into, uh, you know, not only the way that the state, the modern state in Europe was being constructed as a sort of new epistemological or new political technology, as, as uh, Eldon calls it, but then immediately sort of seeing uh, how this is happening in parallel to obviously the colonial world and the mercantilist expansion across the ocean of these sort of networks of trade and everything and the discourses that, that would go with them. And what's interesting is that while there's this kind of opposition that we tend to think of that historically exists somewhat consistently between land and sea, um, and in fact the way that you know the exterior of Europe was understood and constructed through discourses and whatever representations was very different from the way it was constructed at it, on its interior through the, you know, the organization of territory. What's interesting is that circulation cuts across both of these and it opens up, it, it gives birth immediately once uh, discovered by uh, William Harvey in I think 1628 immediately was taken up in, in political discourses, political, early political theories and treatises, and also uh, discourses of trade that had to do with mercantilism and, and colonial trade and, and all this stuff of wealth, whatever. So it, it's really fascinating because circulation, with, with a kind of an archaeological approach to circulation, you can start to trace all the different ways in which political spaces were constructed and, and and how circulation was always somehow seen as the thing which both organizes those spaces, but then also justifies and naturalizes those spaces afterwards. So suddenly, through this kind of washing through this whole history of political uh, geographies uh, and circulation, we can approach Serda and, and all that kind of idealism around circulation in the 19th century as, as actually not something new per se, but a, a, a new of the same kind of uh, conjunction of space and power. So circulation kind of tying space and power together in a new, in this case, a new configuration. Um, so, so suddenly moving from a very biopolitical framework of how circulation and domesticity kind of work together to, you know, to do this thing, suddenly you can approach circulation in a completely different way as uh, more of like a signature of a, completely, of a completely restructuring of space, of, of, of power in space. So how, uh, you know, all the different design decisions that Serda and all of his kind of contemporaries, including today, up to today, all of the decisions that, that somehow are based on movement and circulation, we see that also, I think, as uh, a, a kind of a new definition of territory, uh, a new kind of production of territory at a different scale, uh, unfolding, and I think the urban is something that you can't understand without also understanding territory in that sense too. Um, to to maybe follow that up, I mean that's that's very interesting that you bring up this sort of puncturing of the barrier between interiority, exteriority, mm -hmm. and it's sort of historical link with the dimensions of the land and sea and this 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 territorial boundary. I mean I think because as we've seen circulation intensify. Um, mm -hmm. It, it seems like uh, this is this is very literally the case that the boundary between land and sea mm. eroding. I mean, in in a very yeah. very literal environmental sense. Um, yeah. uh, and and one of it's as a sort of like feedback loop to to this kind of continued process. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the areas, of course, where it's where it's affecting uh, is 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 right here in New York City, where where, yeah. where I'm currently at, uh, and this is having an influence on how people are, in the other sense, you brought up the term applying these technologies of circulation yeah. to to this sort of future of this city. So I was hoping maybe you could you could speak a bit to yeah. uh, to how this has influenced 
your reading of, of projects like Rebuild for Design, yep. uh, the dry line, and sort of uh, this, this, what you call crisis architecture. Yeah. Yeah, and I think um, crisis architecture has many faces right now. It's quite interesting. Um, I was just in New York recently, and I, I, I don't know how I missed this project, but I, I learned only recently about the uh, Hudson Yards project, this massive uh, little gated, effectively a digital, digitally gated community. And, uh, also the same architect, actually, as the dry line, the Bjarne Ingels group, who is doing uh, one of the Google's campuses at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and this is where I start, I think, thinking about the notion of interior, which is a bit more of like yeah. uh, kind of an experimental thought, well, let's say a thought experiment for myself. Yeah. So something we can maybe talk about in a moment. But in terms of rebuild by design, um, in the Bjork Ingalls kind of uh, bonanza, sort of reshaping the entire New York. I mean, first of all, New York, I hadn't been there for not that long four years ago, I think, and, and just there in September, and it's just like a, a totally different city. So it's, it's crazy how things are developing post-crisis of another sort, i.e. the economic crisis. Um, but in terms of the rebuild of the design and the notion of crisis, again, crisis is one of these things that I've been really fascinated by. I read an essay a long time ago now uh, that's become something that I sort of cherish, um, and I make my, all my students read it. Um, to their chagrin, but it, it's, uh, it's just called Crisis by a guy called Reinhard, Rein, Reinhard Koselleck. Um, he's a sort of concept historian. Um, and I think it's, it's really interesting, um, again, you, know, you can think of more recent work by someone like Agamben, State of Exception, and so on, as being very relevant in that way, but, or Naomi Klein, Disaster Capitalism, and so on. Um, I think Crisis, you know, obviously is something that is more and more present in contemporary life um, we can see it in the sort of scrolling CNN aesthetics uh, that we see every day. Um, we can see it in the way that we are constantly kind of addressing notions uh, of crisis and, and crisis kind of dictating so much of the, of the kind of narrative of the everyday. Um, but, but with a project like Rebuild, Rebuild by Design, uh, I mean, it, it really is a project that unlike sustainability or ecological urbanism or whatever we had before it, it's a project that is um, it's embedding a very real crisis, i.e. the Hurricane Sandy of, uh, is it 2011, is it? Or, uh, yeah, that's okay. But I'm <laughs> anyway, yeah, I'm forgetting it right now. Um, where it's no longer about you know, reducing ecological footprint, making things more efficient. All those things, of course, are still there. They don't go away. But now, mobilized under a different name, resilience urbanism, it's about bringing, in a kind of epistemological way, uh, bringing crisis, a real crisis, something that was captured and, and felt and experienced and historically situated within our recent present, uh, recent past, uh, in the very discourse of urbanism and the knowledge of, of how we understand the city. And I think um, you can look, I mean, one, one of the kind of clues of this is that when you look at all the renderings, especially big stuff, they show a space that is completely devoid of crisis. And the fact that it's responding to a crisis is in itself, it speaks volumes, I guess. But more interesting looking at something like Rebuild by Design is it shows again how uh, sort of all these things, all these kind of available toolkits, let's say, come together um, and, and, you know, work to solve a, a you know, whatever problem it is, they, they all will solve it somehow. So like all the cybernetic infrastructures, for example, that start to organize uh, spaces throughout the city, of, throughout New York, uh, give light to this idea that, that the city is kind of uh, uh, under the shadow of permanent crisis all the time, permanent ecological crisis. And because of that, uh, all of the people, all the citizens uh, are of course forced to um, to live in a very different way. Uh, they're forced to kind of interface in a, in a very everyday sort of way with all the various technologies of, of, of emergency management. Um, and this is, again, something that doesn't always make itself obvious in the projects. They, they're often about uh, these sort of feeble addressing of, uh, addresses to things like community and 
um, inclusivity, which is of course, you know, fine. Uh, but, but I think it often covers over the fact that, you know, no matter how many kayaks you can kind of throw into a rendering, uh, you're restructuring the entire city to be this site of future permanent kind of emergency. Um, so it, it's again, a, a, a perhaps reductive in the same way that we can talk about mapping or whatever. It's perhaps kind of narrowing down uh, the problems that are, that we face with climate change to something like crisis. But of course that helps us, I think in my case, to identify ways in which power uh, operates in space and how actually you know, these two things go hand in hand. Um, the thing that's funny about Rebuild by Design is that they use the first initial um, iteration of design schemes to then start talking about restructuring law itself and the structures of law and how the, how the technologies that are imagined then give shape to new laws and legal structures and protocols and whatever, which is a really powerful thing. Um, I mean, in, in the way uh, it gives itself to, you know, if you're an architect, to start thinking about how making images, designing things can, can in fact open up political questions immediately. But in the case of Rebuild the Design, it tends to be more, again, uh, you know, unsurprisingly perhaps, sort of, that the technocratic uh, takes over and that the ideas of community are all these very vapid um, cartoons of what uh, some philosophers would understand as, as real communities that, in fact, uh, are often uh, joined together through things like crisis and the very technologies that, that, that they propose in these kind of projects, the sort of eco-cybernetic uh, nature-based solutions and so on, work in a way to kind of immunize, in a, in a way literally to make non-communal, um, to immunize the, the people who are actually at the forefront of, of facing you know, ecological crisis and therefore connecting through these sort of networks of power, literally networks of power, uh, a sort of the isolated individual uh, data steward and, and so forth. Um, with the, the trust and faith that then that infrastructure will help resolve the emergency and that you shouldn't in a way by, by suggestion, uh, by inverse suggestion, you shouldn't rely on the actual, real, visceral, communal uh, lives and forms of living, forms of life that actually persist uh, throughout any kind of city, especially in this case of emergency. So it becomes, I guess, a, a sort of crutch to imagining something otherwise or a conditioned subjectivity in a particular Absolutely. Absolutely, and this is something that, yeah, that I've been also very fascinated with, and, and especially this, is, this comes from the rendering, too, and um, how, you know, the notion of crisis today, and, and I'm sure it's probably, in a way, always been this way, but the notion of crisis today um, demobilizes any sort of imaginary of a future or any sort of imaginary of what it can, can mean to live politically, in a way. Um, and, and that doesn't mean necessarily that we have to get rid of technology and in fact I think as, as you probably know a lot of accelerationist discussions are about actually you know reform, reformulating technological networks and, and so on uh, but of course again it's, it's always that these kinds of projects uh, in a way assist in detaching uh, questions of space questions of events like crises and questions of infrastructural networks, they detach all of those from any sort of political forms or political orders that maybe you know, give rise to them in the first place or that in fact uh, subjectivize us in a kind of daily basis. So we don't make visible uh, those sort of relations and therefore the imagination of the future is captured in this sort of technocratic uh, reproduction of the present. And again, this is something I think more specific to um, the context of climate change where uh, our best future is basically this desperate attempt to kind of maintain our current status. Um, and I think that's, again, something that reflects also on a very clear political statement that the more we understand about neoliberalism, about the history of liberalism, about yeah, of course, um, uh, capitalism uh, that, that operates within and through that political sort of landscape, uh, the more we see that climate change is in a way an effect of liberalism, of you know, 200, century, 200 years of, of kind of industrial capitalism and the political and legal forms that have given, given shape to that. Um, 
And so it's this really feeble, in a sense, uh, and, and in a bit psychotic kind of attempt to, to grasp and, and to cling to these images of the present um, that I think is, is tremendously damaging in a way to how we as artists, activists, architects, urbanists, um, and so on, have access to something like the future. Like what do we do with the future? If, if, um, if not just kind of reproducing these happy, domestic, technologically driven kind of lives that we have now. Yeah. Um, no, I think it's, uh, I, I kind of wanted to uh, continue in this line in, in terms of, I mean, I guess, yeah, you, you really do see the, the sort of, um, paucity of, of kind of uh, the neoliberal vision, but also, I guess, to some degree, maybe the imagination of the kind of architecture that represents it. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, one of the things that really struck me about something like the dry line proposal uh, is that essentially it operates as a giant wrapper, um, these, sort yeah. of, these sort of format of, of postmodern <laughs> architecture that yeah. Champion, you know, throughout the '90s, and and of course, again, going maybe back to to Jameson, uh, for him, you know, postmodernism represents the sort of like cultural logic of of late capitalism. Yeah. Uh, and I guess thinking about that, uh, this sort of emptiness of the form of the rapper, it's it's sort of superficial simulacra. You you kind of mm -hmm. this other concept that that you raise. Um, mm -hmm. Which, which is maybe a bit more symptomatic in, in its framing, uh, and that is the concept of the interior. And I guess mm -hmm. it's something maybe on that a little bit, yeah. and, and its uh, relation to this concept of circulation that, that you brought mm -hmm. up. Yeah, yeah. I sort of think everything's related to circulation, and I think probably I'm going a bit mental. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you bring up this question of the rapper, and it's, like, it's something that I haven't um, I hadn't thought about until you sort of mentioned that um, the idea of the semiotics and the whole play of, of signs and floating signifiers and whatever. Um, it's interesting, um, specifically if I if I reflect back on this again sort of thought experiment of um, of interior, but I guess um, for me this idea that. That I'm trying to develop with you speak about it in the way that, uh, and this is probably a bit pretentious, but in the way that like, Negri and Hart talk about not the empire, but empires in general condition. Um, it's really just for me a, a polemic way to uh, start to address, um, or start to sort of turn the question of architecture and things like neoliberalism around. So I think, you know, again, speaking of semiotics, forms of representation, we have this history and this sort of meaning means to NLA um, that, especially with regards to neoliberalism and so forth, there's a lot of good critique coming around these days and sort of politically addressing, uh, you know, architecture space and so on. Um, but I think we tend to, to treat architecture not as seriously as we should. And that, I don't mean to sound like a kind of, you know, um, whatever. I, I, what I'm trying to say is uh, we tend to think of architecture as the kind of product of other forces or the sort of outcome of another field of, uh, of power structures and, um, and, and process. And, and that we can only go in and, and sort of pick up a building and say like, or, or an urban space or whatever, and say like, look, this reveals like how power works. And, you know, you might not see it that way, but now I've shown you. I, I start to think more that we need to treat architecture as uh, something that has much more agency than that, uh, as something that isn't the last uh, kind of outcome of a certain rationalized thought process or irrational kind of thought process, but that that is very instrumental in um, playing with politics. So I guess this idea of interior sort of came out of that frustration. That's something I also read about with regards to the urban and so on. Um, but I guess I see that. Um, I'm trying to understand interior as a condition, as a sort of spatio-political condition, uh, and that that is something that, uh, if we, if if I kind of allow myself to historicize this kind of crazy idea, 
um, it, it's not like, oh, let's say like this. Um, if we look at a project like Foster Partners uh, Airport or a number of other kind of big, new, uh, fancy architect kind of airports and, and other kinds of spaces, we see this tendency, I think, towards interiorizing, it's like this larger and larger, almost kind of Buckminster Fuller um, uh, uh, sort of a, approach to architecture, where architecture kind of um, uh, uh, transcends itself. It becomes like a background, one that almost disappears, and that when you're inside, you sort of lose track of its limits and its boundaries. Um, it becomes something that conditions. Here we go, maybe more towards Slaughterdyke. Uh, it becomes much more like atmospheric. Uh, and so in a sense, in an effort to kind of think about this as not like a kind of a new uh, way of understanding the, the immediate present and, you know, our destiny in the future, uh, but something as, as, as having reached a certain maturity, uh, I find it again interesting to make, to, to, to draw on history and to think about this as something that's long in coming. It's been long in coming in a way. Um, so, looking at like the kind of 19th century Palais de l'Industrie and, and so forth, the things that, the sort of architectures that would appear in, in Paris and London with Crystal Palace that of course Sloterdijk also talks about. Um, I, I try to put the hypothesis that, that actually interior as a, as a kind of uh, political or spatio-political idea uh, is actually it far uh, precedes these uh, and kind of anticipates these. And, and it's only in the 19th century that uh, suddenly architecture um, becomes a way of understanding, a way of materializing almost a diagram or, or a kind of a metaphor in a way of this, of this kind of emerging and growing power. And I think, uh, again, it's a sort of thought experiment, uh, but nevertheless, it forces me in a way to think about architecture by, by posing the question in reverse. So when we look at something like Foster Partners Airport, it's not to say that it's uh, this, this radically new kind of condition or something, but more uh, uh, to treat it as the kind of accidental uh, manifestation of this sort of structure of power that you're actually not supposed to see. And uh, that it becomes that way a, a very powerful um, way of making visible uh, the way a kind of spatio-political or almost a political phenomenology has been slowly constructing itself more and more uh, um, over the years. And again, I think that's why, I, of course, I'm drawing a lot of connections in my research with the urban, seeing the urban as not just the outcome or product of capitalist relations or um, you know, this sort of uh, stylistic kind of art historical thing that happens when you have new technologies and new discourses, but actually as itself power, in the very same way that Serda, you know, in his kind of uh, silly way says the same thing. Um, why can't we think of, um, you know, as we draw on, on issues like environmentality more recently, or onto power, like Brian Lassini talks about, um, why is it that in a way, we wait for political theorists or social theorists to invent new ways of seeing the world when, in fact, it may be as architects or spatial practitioners that we already are able to see uh, beyond what architecture shows, or in a way that, that architecture isn't about representing power in a sort of old school way or the way that the postmodern uh, discourse uh, transcoded forms of representation but actually the way that, that architecture allows us to construct philosophical discourses or political uh, diagrams in a way that we can then build new theories around, new understandings of, of ontologies and phenomenologies of, of power. So again, it's, it's very early, I think, in, in, um, in its development in my own head, I guess, but uh, it's kind of fun to think about, I guess, and it, it, it helps us to maybe, again, maybe the most important thing is it helps us to pose questions of architecture in relation to power in a sort of inverse way. Yeah, and how the, the I mean, yeah, it's, it's very interesting because it seems like there's, there's kind of a, two different impulses there. One is kind of a, a resistance maybe to the total erasure of politics, uh, maybe as envisioned by Serta originally. Yeah, uh, but then also a kind of uh, awareness that 
the politics embedded in the technology uh, can be used to alter the kind of futures that we may have yeah. been. So yeah, that's a very very uh, engaging thought. Um, yeah. It's still, again, still like, um, I think at this point, it's still just much more polemical and I'm kind of trying to wrap my head around these ideas at the same time that I'm you know, making arguments about them. <laughs> so. No, I mean, I'm, there's some very fascinating ideas here. I mean, I think one of the things I found really interesting, too, about this, this conception of the, the interior that you had and how you sort of posed it, I mean, especially in relation to, to Serta's use of your use of circulation and your reference to to Serta's use of circulation mm -hmm. um, was was kind of the the imagery for you the interior uh, especially now in the present and how how architecture has kind of become the air itself as you as, as you stated yeah. Um, yeah. that this transformation of architecture into this sort of like total amorphous background rather than with Serta where it kind of operated as more of a mediating structure. You have doors, windows, mm, on it, yeah. something that maybe is much more present in kind of yeah. modernist architecture than, than in, in perhaps postmodernist architecture. And I think mm -hmm. it's very interesting that both of those relate to uh, different sort of forms of subjectivization, but also very different sort of political systems. Yeah. Or, or maybe the, the kind of radicalization, we should say, of the liberal political system in yeah. the neoliberal political system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's an interest. It's a really interesting question. Uh, and again, you can start to sort of see these problems in really interesting ways when you look at, you know, you don't make recourse immediately to the, the theories, let's say, or, or histories of these political ideas, but actually the spaces and architecture. So. It's interesting that you point out like the awnings and openings and doors and whatever in Serda's model of the urbe, which he calculates with this kind of fastidious and, and a bit neurotic uh, levels of detail where like, you know, you can't open a door because that will interrupt the great vialidad as he calls it. And, and there's no stopping once you're out there. And so awnings pose these in, imminent threats to people moving about and whatever. Um, but all of that, again, uh, uh, you know, in a way, suggests a certain sense of subjectivity that works throughout, uh, uh, you know, 19th and in a way early 20th century notion of subjectivity, which is that, you know, this this, this new entrepreneurial man, of course, is a man, um, that will autonomously, you know, enact his will to freedom by circulating and trading and and, um, and commanding businesses around the world um, without any obstruction, and so this idea of um, in a way, uh, carving a space out uh, where economy can be free. Um, and that, to me, in a way, really corresponds with a, with a quintessential liberal sort of notion. And I think if you sort of fast forward to something more contemporary, thinking of like cybernetics and how um, new ideas of circulation, uh, open, new technologies of circulation open up new ways of, of organizing space and of understanding space, uh, we start to also in that process see a different type of subjectivity at play. And uh, here again we can draw on the whole question of environmentality that a lot of people have talked about. But um, in a way with, with cybernetics, you don't um, uh, assume that there's this kind of rational figure who has to be understood to be kind of subject to the laws, the bylaws, the, 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 way, the cues that are inscribed in space in order to guide the freedom, the construction of a freedom of the individual. But instead, you uh, open up a new space in which the irrationality, the, the sort of strange, dark domestic behaviors of people, the, the weird websites we look at, our habits and desires that have, in, for the modernist kind of agenda, always been outside of the scope of control. Um, and so this whole new kind of range of, of, um, of knowledge and, and therefore, again, to, not to sound too Foucaultian, but of, also of power and its, and its kind of way of operating within uh, this space opens itself up. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think you can start to see across this divide, uh, yeah, you can, you can definitely play that where, you know, the, the neoliberal subject is uh, one around which 
you don't need a kind of prescribed space that is, you know, the free market versus one that's the sort of managed welfare state or whatever. Um, but in fact, life itself is the market. The market is everything. And therefore, it's about knowing and, and mediating and understanding in its finite details, in its kind of infinitesimally small metadata and whatever, how people behave and the, the activities and habits and desires of people so that, 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 of course, get you know, processed through algorithms and transcribed into forms of management and persuasion. So it's a very, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting inversion, I think. Yeah, no, I think of Poilebeck's uh, a phrase of the, the elementary particles, um, or, or maybe uh, in, in, in the recent translation of Guy Chatelet's book, he sort of talks about the kind of atomization of the subject, mm -hmm. sort of, you know, Robinson particles of, of the yeah. Uh, yeah. subjectivity. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a project I'm working on right now, but I'm... I'm I'm trying to, to come back in a way to the body, the question of the body, um, and, and um, sort of tentatively titling this project Nomos of the Body, but to try to understand how uh, historically, again, I mean, I think I, I, it's becoming a trope now for me to, to, to always historicize certain things, but it helps, I guess, um, to see how uh, historically the body has, has uh, or images and perceptions of the body have been very helpful in both understanding forms of power and structures of power, and at the same time, the way we construct space and organize space. Um, and I think with, with something like cybernetics and cybernetic urbanism, we see yet again the body becoming this kind of transparent shadow, uh, who, which doesn't manifest itself as a body anymore, but gets completely uh, 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 fragmented into or, or understood through its effects in space, rather than um, through a body as a biological, you know, controllable subject. So, in a way, the question of subjectivity is also maybe becoming atomized itself, um, not so much even around the individual, but around, like, the individual. That, well, I mean, I think there's, I mean, there's some very interesting, um, I mean, there's a, that, that kind of interesting diagram, diagramatization of the subject itself on, under these sort of stru structures, these algorithms that track you, that sort of like yeah. reconstruct who you are in order to feed you, you know, Facebook advertisement or, or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Side, which, which side of the political spectrum you should see the news from today. Right, um, exactly. <laughs> um, it doesn't help our current political situation probably too much. Uh, <laughs> everyone wanting to kill each other. No, uh, maybe, maybe we actually, I think we're getting near to when we should probably wrap up, but I think, uh, you know, it would be very remiss if we did not at least address uh, the recent election and the sort of transformation. Uh, yeah. it, it, it propends for uh, not only the future of New York City, but, but the world. I mean, my, my sort of, one of my impulses in, in beginning this project was to examine the city in global relations and the recent election of, of Trump is, is very much going to change the, the global landscape. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I guess maybe one of the interesting things in, in sort of jumping off from your work uh, or how I was thinking from your work uh, is, is how you kind of trace these transformations over time of architecture uh, uh, and the transformations of, of neoliberalism or transformation from liberalism to neoliberalism and even earlier beyond that and how that has been represented in architecture. But I guess uh, we, we are now maybe seeing a time when, when sort of classic liberalism is dead, when mm -hmm. neoliberalism may, may morph into sort of authoritarian capitalism. Mm -hmm. so I guess I'm wondering how... Uh, maybe you see, or, I mean, I don't know if you can answer this, but how you see architecture changing, to, yeah. or maybe even what we can do uh, proactively and politically to, to sort of challenge this transformation. Yeah, well, it's funny, when you, when you ask about architecture transforming, I suddenly imagine uh, having to call the White House the Trump House from yeah. now on to the end of history. Um, no, I don't know. Um, yeah, how architecture works into this whole story, I really obviously have no idea, I think. But I think, you know, it, it may be a mistake to think that we're moving beyond neoliberalism. This is my first impulse. Um, 
I was in a, a recent presentation that day after the election, and it was, it was someone talking about um, neoliberalism and affect and, and so on, which was really fascinating. And I thought to be kind of cheeky, I, I would ask the question, so how does your whole work now sit now that we're beyond neoliberalism? Of course, joking in a way. Um, and I, and, and the respo her response was, there's no way we're beyond neoliberalism. This is like, um, this is, Trump is the apogee of, of neoliberalism in a way. Um, and, and we'll seek you know, to kind of only uh, harden, or if that's not the right sort of neoliberal term, to loosen, let's say, um, uh, the way that, that the state is kind of formed as the economy itself. Uh, and I guess, you know, Zizek would probably say that, you know, capitalism always has been authoritarian. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I feel almost exhausted to, to think about this right now, um, just because it's, it's, it's something that I've learned in a very short period of time uh, that when I, when I begin thinking about the, the election, it just really brings me down in a, in a big way. Um, yeah, I, it's a scary, it's a scary moment right now. Um, it seems there's a lot of, of angst and, and anger, which is, I think is completely uh, understandable. Um, unfortunately, the, the anger has been, you know, given a narrative which is super simplistic and of course loosens up um, existing uh, forms of racism and, and bigotry and so forth and justifies it and gives it voice and whatever. Uh, but I think, I mean, in a way, I'm sure a lot of that has already been talked about the death. Um, what I guess might be more relevant uh, just at the moment is, is how, you know, our, our, the, the left, if, if we can maybe now finally call ourselves a left, I don't know, um, how we have, have in the beginning just kind of constantly mapped out what happened, you know, whoa, how did this happen? And of course, the same thing happened with Brexit. There were immediately all these graphs about, you know, the rural... Uh, poor, it was the uneducated, and so on and so forth. Um, and I think, I think what that really brings back into the picture is something that maybe was kind of put, put aside, even in the sort of, uh, almost in like, in the way, and I blame myself in a sense, the way that Foucault has been so powerful um, in, in, in recent discussions, how class is something that, that we somehow uh, left behind. I mean, I think neoliberalism, and in that sense, liberalism too. Uh, neoliberalism has hugely uh, powerful, profound, and visceral effects on uh, over the past forty years. In you know, in, in, if we're thinking about the states in places like the Rust Belt and down south and wherever, um, in, in, in providing you know extreme amounts of access to a bourgeois and, and a kind of haute bourgeois class. Uh, and, and pandering to them, pandering to the Silicon Valleys, uh, you know, to the point where we don't even say working class anymore, where it's kind of a, a political end game uh, to, to even mention it if you're, if you're a politician. Um, and that, that's been extremely, it's been, you know, the, the whole mappings of urban and rural, I think, should give pause to us to think about how, uh, how immediate and visceral neoliberalism has been uh, on so many people that it doesn't mean, it, in fact, it, it has nothing to do with education. Um, that, that these kinds of things can be tremendously violent and destructive to, to lives. Um, and of course, then, then the worst part of that story is that, uh, you know, Trump and, and Lafarge and all these people have, have spun it into this immediate thing where you can completely um, translate that anger, anger into uh, kind of hating your neighbor sort of scenario. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there's a brilliance in these, in these right-wing guys. They, they've picked up on something and, and translated it in a super simple way that has a huge effect over the world, and it's a global thing in a sense. I mean, the rhetoric of atomization and individualism um, mm -hmm. seems yeah. to, to sort of follow a kind of zero-sum game in which I have something that somebody else can't. Yeah. And uh, that, that unfortunately seem, seems to... Uh, uh, excuse me. We're, we're kind of on, still on the... But yeah, let's chat in a minute. 
Sorry. Uh, one, uh, <laughs> a, a friend dropped by. Um, uh, sorry, I, I lost my train of thought. But yeah, I was just going to say, no, this, this seems to have translated into, into a tribalism that, that's, that yeah, exactly. helped to kind of uh, stoke the people's worst impulses. Exactly. Um, exactly. And, and, and expand them. Uh, and I mean, I don't know that it's necessarily monocausal, that we can just say, yes, it's economics, yes, it's racism. Right. But I think these two things definitively influence mm -hmm. one another. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one thing I've, I've, I've always been yeah. really um, frustrated with in America is how we censor ourselves in speaking about politics. How politics are always somehow um, addressed through lifestyle, through buying one car versus another, through putting bumper stickers on or not, uh, through the clothes you wear. Um, but, you know, and, and this is something, I don't know if you've, uh, if you've seen the book uh, Outlaw Territories by Felicity Scott. It's, uh, it's a, an incredible text that, in a sense, it's, it's not meant to do this, but one of the sort of sub-arguments is about uh, American counterculturalism um, and how the kind of counterculture uh, of the 60s and 70s was always uh, attempting to kind of depoliticize its own rhetoric and to turn it into a kind of dem demonstrable uh, construction of lifestyle. And coming back to the States after having been away for about 11 years in total, one of the most frustrating things is how impossible it is to talk about politics, not only because people don't know politics or how to talk about them or how to think through history because we've kind of purged all that from our formative education, but also because politics seems to be a complete taboo, a complete kind of game stopper or whatever that, you know, like everything just kind of comes to a crashing halt if you talk about politics. Uh, and, and coming to the Midwest, what's interesting is when we first move in here, we get knocks on the door, you know, people with cookies and very nice neighbors and everything. And, and they tell you you should join their church um, and that, that you should, you know, join this one, you know, denomination or another. Um, and so it seems that something which I consider to be somewhat private in a way, you know, faith, uh, is, is a very public thing, something that you can talk about and you can, you know, it's almost a site of social um, activity. But politics... Uh, you can't talk about. It. You make people really uncomfortable when you when you speak about politics, and in a way, that's one of the biggest issues here. I think um, that we don't have recourse to understand politics. So on one side, you get these very easy um, um, reductions of oh, poor, uneducated white racist. That's why Trump is there. And on the other side, you know, uh, the, the it's just as obviously as simple as like oh, these immigrants are taking our jobs and so on. So. Uh, we end up in this situation where by not being able to speak comfortably about politics and not being able to disagree with one another comfortably, we're in this situation where there's this tremendous feeling of like violence everywhere. And not only feeling, but you know, manifestation of it. Yeah. No, it seems like it's, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be very difficult kind of finding uh, means of building coalitions of kind yeah. of understanding the situation and rearticulating a, a sort of political future that is yeah. any other than I guess, what we see kind of being offered in Trumpism. Yeah, it's interesting now, all this stuff I talk about, about there's no such thing as the future anymore. Now I think we have very clear images of the future, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's interestingly terrifying, but probably good for that reason. It probably wakes us up a bit. Well, it's weird that in Trumpism, it's, it's a very backward-looking uh, uh, philosophy, at least what is intelligible of it. I'm not sure it's so much a philosophy that's probably the wrong word to use, but as it, as it is a sort of affective appeal that, that to some people seems to, to read as something coherent. Yeah. But insofar it is, as it, as, as it presents something, it's very backwards-looking in terms of it's about returning to a past sort of yeah. fictional past yeah. of what America was like, um, yeah. but is not a future that responds to the conditions of the present that we are now in, and a future that addresses the inequalities of the situation. Absolutely. It completely yeah. uh, steps over those, those issues. Yeah.
Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I guess I want to ask, uh, do you have anything uh, else to, to add before we leave any issues that you feel like we, we should cover that maybe we, we didn't get to? No. Yeah, no, I think, um, I think we've managed to exhaust everything. This is uh, all of my knowledge. <laughs> I don't all know anything else. problems are solved after tonight. Trump will be out by tomorrow, and no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so no, this is this has been a really nice conversation, and I think I'm I'm happy. I, 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 you've posed questions in ways that I haven't really thought about before, and, and that's always really useful. And I'm, I've got a lot to kind of reflect on as well. So, thank you. Well, well, thank you, Ross. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to to speak to me tonight and and contribute to uh, to this exhibition. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a good night. And uh, if you have anything that you want to follow up with, please feel free to contact me, and uh, we can see what we can do to to make sure that gets heard. So, all right, all right. All right. Thank, thank you me. very much, Josh. All right, thank you, Ross. Have a good night. You too.